Hi everyone, in this video I'll be explaining the problems from Leak Code Weekly Contest 291. I got 89th place in this contest, which is pretty good. This is like top 100, which I haven't gotten, I think, ever, perhaps. Um, and I finished in 21 minutes, so that's pretty good. I think this is because the problems were relatively uh, not so difficult, didn't require any big-brained algorithms or anything. Uh, I just did it pretty fast. So, let's go through the problems. Problem one, remove digit from number to maximize results. Basically, we're given a integer given as a string, and we're given a single digit, which is also given as a string. Our job is to remove one instance of this digit from the integer such that the resulting number is maximized. This is pretty standard. No algorithms or anything required. It's just brute force. Basically, what I did is I just took the number. I went through all of its digits. Um, if a digit is equal to the given digit, then we remove it and add it to a list somewhere. And then after we try all the possibilities of removing all the possible digits, we see which one um, has the largest results. And we can just compare those as strings, don't have to cast them to, as integers. And then we just take the largest integer and that's a result. And then problem two, minimum consecutive cards to pick up. In this problem, we have an array of integers and each integer represents the value of a card. So first, in this example, we have uh, six cards and the values are 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 7. We have to pick up some consecutive number of cards such that it contains two cards that have the same value. We want to find the minimum such consecutive card range um, that has a matching pair. Now, this is also relatively standard. Uh, no fancy algorithms or anything required. Basically, we just have to keep track of all the occurrences of all the numbers and then try um, all the pairs between two of the same number. So let's just take an example. Over here, we have three, four, two, three, four, seven. We have a few options here. We can take these two threes um, and take all the numbers in between them. And it's always optimal to have the same number on both ends uh, because if you went one further, you could always just cut it back down. So uh, we don't want to pick up any more cards than necessary. Uh, so we could pick up those two threes or we could pick up these two fours. Now, the way that we know that these two pairs are ones that we can take um, is basically we keep track of a map and in this map we store all of the indices of all integers that have appeared. So this will be x and this is the indices that it will have appeared in. So 3 um, appears at index 0, 4 appears at index 1, 2 appears at index 2, and then 3 also appears at index 3, uh, 4 again appears at index 4, and then 7 appears at index 5. If we have any integer that only appears once in the deck, then obviously we can't select um, a consecutive range that contains two of those values, so we have to rule out all of those. Um, and that is what this line of code over here is doing. If there is only one occurrence of that integer, um, then we don't have to consider it. Otherwise, we look through the range of indices, look through consecutive values. Uh, if there were more instances of four, for example, if there was another instance of four here, we would add index six here, and we would just consider all of these possible ranges between consecutive occurrences of four, um, and we do the same for three, and then just see which one has the smallest range, and that's gonna be our answer. Okay, question three. K divisible element subarrays. We're given an array of integers, um, as well as two other integers, K and P. We need to return the number of distinct subarrays that have at most K elements divisible by P. Now, this is just a really roundabout way of saying, consider all subarrays of an array and find how many values in, that, in a given subarray contain um, numbers that are divisible by p, count them up. If that is less than or equal to k, then we can count that subarray. Consider all such subarrays of that type um, and find all distinct such subarrays. Now, the thing is we can't consider two of the same subarrays. So, for example, if we had two over here as just a one element subarray and two over here as another one element subarray, uh, we cannot count those as distinct. So we have to make some kind of set structure uh, to make sure we don't get any duplicates. So the solution for this one is also rather simple. We need to use prefix sums for this, or at least I use prefix sums, they might not be necessary. Basically, prefix sum is gonna tell us for all prefixes of the array, uh, how many numbers in that prefix are divisible by P. Now, if you don't understand prefix sums, um, it's a really great technique to know. Uh, it's kind of a data structure. It's also an algorithm, sort of. Basically, it uh, keeps track of sums of prefixes. Now, if you're not familiar with prefix sums, I'll link something down in the description. So I'm, I'm going to assume you're a bit familiar with it, at least. Uh, inside this prefix, we're going to store how many numbers so far are divisible by a given number. So here we're using the digits of pi. Let's say p equals 2. 
uh, then the prefix would look like 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. I realize I made a mistake here. It should be 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, because 6 is also even. Um, so you can see that it increases by 1 whenever we encounter an even number, because even numbers are divisible by 2. Now that's going to be a perfect sum, and it's going to help us determine which subarrays satisfy the given quantity. Because, for example, if we took uh, this subarray over here, uh, we could use the prefix sum array to tell us that there are exactly two evens in this subarray. Now that's just an example. We can apply this to the general problem pretty easily just by constructing a prefix sum like this. Uh, keeping track of how many numbers are, again, divisible by p up to a given index. And then we can use an Owen squared algorithm to just loop through all possible subarrays. And for each subarray, find out how many numbers in that subarray are divisible by p using the prefix sum. If it satisfies the condition that there are less than or equal to k of those uh, numbers, then we can add it to a set. And sets are data structures that make sure all the elements in it are unique. So every time we count a subarray, we can uh, rest assured that it's only going to be counted once. After that, we have our sets of subarrays, and then we can just return it to get all the unique subarrays that satisfy the given condition. Okay, problem four. Now this is a somewhat tricky one. You need to find the right angle to look at it. We define the appeal of a string to be the number of distinct characters found in that string. And our job is to, given any arbitrary string, find the total appeal of all its substrings. And a substring is defined to be a contiguous sequence of characters within a string. So this one is kind of challenging to think about because um, the range here is that the strings could be up to 10 to the 5, so obviously an n squared algorithm is not going to work. Uh, what we could do here instead is think about it not in terms of counting distinct letters within a substring, but instead for every given letter, how many substrings is it a unique letter of? Now that might be a bit confusing to understand, so let's do an example here. This A is going to be unique A in this substring, this substring, this substring, this substring, and let's say this substring, um, this long one here. Now it's not the only A in this substring, but we're going to count it as the sort of representative A of that substring. And in total, uh, let's mark down all the substrings actually. So we have A, A, B, A, B, B, C, A, and then we have A. So in total, there's going to be 15 substrings here that we have to consider. So this leftmost A, uh, we're going to consider it the sort of representative A for all of these substrings. So it's going to be the representative A in these substrings and in this substring. And our general technique is going to be to count substrings for a given letter that have this letter as its leftmost occurrence of that letter. And you'll see what I mean in a bit. Okay, so we've considered that A, and we've marked down all the A's in these five substrings. So going on to the second B, uh, we're going to again consider how much it contributes to the total appeal of the string. It's going to be the sort of representative B in this substring, this substring, sorry, that substring, that substring, that substring, that substring, as well as this one, this one, this one, and this one. So if we mark out all of those substrings, that B is representative in this one, um, this one, this one, this one, and this one, this one, this one, and this one. And that's going to be eight different substrings that, in which this B contributes to the overall appeal. Now again, we're considering this B as the sort of representative B, even if it's not the only B, because it's the leftmost B in all of these substrings. Okay, moving on to this third B, this is where what I've talked about so far comes into effect. Um, we're going to look to the left and we're going to look to the right, right? But we're not going to include both Bs again in any substring that this third B or this second B represents. Because again, we're considering a letter to be contributing to the overall appeal um, only if it's the leftmost occurrence of a letter in a substring. Uh, so we're going to only consider these three substrings um, as substrings where this second B contributes to the overall appeal. And that's going to be in a substring, the substring, the substring. Okay, so far so good. Now looking at this C, uh, this C is going to be contributing to the overall appeal um, in any range, left or right. Now again, that just means we take some number of characters here, some number of characters here, and that's going to result in uh, like eight possible substrings. Uh, and they're going to look like this. Yeah, and those eight are going to be the substrings in which this C uh, contributes to the overall appeal. And we're just going to mark that here, here, uh, here, 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 and here, and here. Yeah, and I missed one C right there, but there's eight total. 
Okay, finally, for the last A, uh, it's going to contribute to overall appeal only in these substrings because it's not the leftmost A uh, in this substring, which is the whole string. So we're only going to count it as part of four. This one, this one, this one, this one. Yeah, those are the four. We're not going to include it here because that A has already been counted by uh, a different A left to the last A. So there we go. There's our algorithm, sort of. Um, we keep track of all the indices of any given letter in a dictionary over here. And our algorithm is basically to go through all of the occurrences for any given letter. So for example, if we have a string and there's some A's spaced out between them, here, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna consider this A as contributing to the overall appeal when it's part of any substring that looks like this, starting anywhere to the left of it um, and going anywhere to the right, so however long this substring wants to be to the right, all of these substrings are going to be counted as having an A. And similarly, when we move on to the second one, um, it can be any substring that starts off like this, so it's cut off before the first A, and then it goes all the way to the right again, and all of these substrings starting at this boundary or at this boundary, anywhere in between, and including this A, uh, is going to be counted as a substring that has an A because it has this A. Now that mixing and matching is done by multiplication over here by finding how many characters to the left can we start the substring and how many characters to the right can we start a substring. At the end we just add all those up and that's going to be our answer. So yeah that's it for Leak Code Weekly Contest 291. Hope these explanations were helpful. You can always take a look at my code by navigating to this page which I'll link to down below. So there we go. Um, that's the contest. Hope you enjoyed the problems and my explanations. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.